Hey, welcome. We're in the book of Exodus. We're studying at Exodus 13 today, verses 11 to 15. Let's take a read of what's in those lines. Now, when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord. But every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And it came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So there's the command. The firstborn who opens the womb is to be sacrificed to the Lord. Now, the firstborn animals. And what's this all about? Well, the ultimate purpose in it, hopefully you understand, is to prepare people to uh, receive the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, who is the truly the lamb, Revelation 13, 8, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All these sacrifices are little symbols, little pictures pointing, pointing us to Jesus, the true Lamb of God. And so these sacrifices are instituted here to remind, remember, God is kind of re-educating his people. They've been under the influence of, uh, all around them for or as long as they've been alive of the, the, the different gods of Egypt, the crocodile god, the frog gods, and, and, and all the scare beetle god, and all the different god this and god there, everywhere a god, god, all these fake gods, which God, you know, showed were fake during the 10 plagues. They've been, under, they've been surrounded by those influences, and now God is doing what? God is, is sort of re-educating them. He's given them an, an intensive, a quick, intensive course. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread here in this chapter is one of the ways that he's, he's helping them remember the things that form their history, that form the beginnings of them as his people. God wants them to all be pointed towards Jesus again, because ultimately all that stuff points to Jesus. So these sacrifices... Far from being, you know, useless or just a waste of animal or unnecessary cruelty to animals or something, they are pointing people to something very important, very moral, very ethical, very definite, that, that God makes the sacrifice for us. God provides the sacrifice. He is the one who provides deliverance. He is the one who provides bread. He provides sustenance. He is the saver. He is the deliverer. He is the provider and uh, getting us away from thinking of doing it all on our own, you know, by our own bootstraps. God wants us to trust in him. So all this pointed to Jesus to direct the minds of God's people to Jesus. Now, I mean, you might have noticed here that if the firstborn of the animals, uh, if the firstborn wasn't, was not um, consecrated to the Lord, its neck was broken and it was killed. I mean, that might strike us kind of weird. And why might this be? Well, remember, the firstborn, God said what? God said, I have decided the firstborn are mine. So if, if that animal's not given to the Lord as it should be, then it would be what? Well, I guess well, I'll keep it for my own use. No, God says no, and he wants to teach them very closely. Uh, the things that belong to God are for God. The things that are left to us are for us. But the firstborn belongs to God. And so if the firstborn animal wasn't to be, wasn't sacrificed to God, then the person wasn't to personally benefit from it. They had to kill it. So it would be, then it would be a total waste. See, the reason it has to be destroyed is it belongs to God. And so God sets the instructions for what to do with it. If it belongs to God, then, then it's his business. He tells you what to do and you say, yes, sir. Failure to do what God says with God's stuff is, means you're stealing. It means you're claiming, well, it's not yours, it's mine. And so this is a way still um, primitive, though it it's, may seem to us, this is a way that God is helping show us what belongs to him and put it into our heart and mind some things belong to god you know a lot of people today they don't like the way the world is they wish that maybe they had a longer nose or a shorter nose some things aren't given to us some things belong to god some things belong to us ultimately everything belongs to god 
And so he's showing us here that the firstborn belongs to him. God was first, God is always first, and we need to remember and live that way and put God first. It's the only thing that makes sense for us as, as creatures and him as the creator. Now, finally, did you notice here uh, the reason given for the sacrifice? It's at the bottom of verse 15. Therefore, I sacrifice, I, the, the head of the household, sacrifice to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So this is the, the father's duty is to redeem the son, which is an echo of the father in Jesus also. So this is what God wants kept in the center. Not really so much the part that we play, although there are certain things God has for us to do, but the part that God does is the, is the key, it is the central, it is the only meritorious part. And so we want God to be in the center, God's sacrifice in the center, God's deliverance in the center, God's power in the center, and God's person in the center. And he wants us to have a person, it's kind of like a cliche, but boy though, it, it, rightly understood, God wants a personal relationship between, between him and you. And there's no higher privilege that can be attained to. May God bless you as you walk with him today.